we're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So it's Sunday, March 20th, 2022, the first day of spring. It's the Vernal Equinox. Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future of radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. All right, we we're having some technical difficulties uh, broadcasting on our social media platforms, but it looks like we got those fixed also. Now, I taught my online classes this weekend, and it was uh, it's been a busy weekend. We had uh, some great classes today um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And then yesterday, I taught ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So uh, later in the show, we're going to talk a little bit about the Vicksburg Massacre of 1874 in Vicksburg, Mississippi. That's one of the things that we talked about in class today because we're dealing with the Reconstruction era. Now, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, and, and, and many of you all saw that. We had a great show on Friday. Uh, one of the things we talked about was in the House of Representatives, the Crown Act um, has finally passed the House of Representatives. And the Crown Act is uh, dealing with uh, banning discrimination against African-American hairstyles. Crown stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. Uh, the Crown Act prohibits discrimination based on an individual's texture, uh, uh, texture or style of hair. Now, the bill passed 225. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, count was 225, 235, 235 to 189. Only 14 Republicans voted for the bill. Now, isn't that surprising? OK, we're going to talk about this on today's show. Now, there's there's some deep history that's tied to this as well. And it's called the Tian Laws. OK, the Tian Laws of 1786 in uh, Louisiana. I've talked about this before and in, in, uh, on our show and in some of my lectures as well. Uh, but the Tian laws were targeting uh, Creole women and uh, either free or slave uh, enslaved in Louisiana, 1786. And they had to cover their hair. They had to wear head wraps. And this was designed to keep white men from being attracted to African-American women. It didn't work. This was designed to keep white men from being attracted to African-American women. We're going to talk about the Tion laws also of 1786 in uh, Louisiana. But the uh, Crown Act has passed the House. It's headed to the Senate. And we have to get this pushed through in the Senate also. Now, back uh, it was back on March 14th. We talked about... Uh, Mississippi uh, Governor Tate Reeves, Republican, idiotic Governor Tate Reeves. And he signed this anti-critical race theory in the law. But surprisingly, a lot of the Republicans in the state legislature in Mississippi that voted for the bill, they can't tell you what critical race theory is. OK, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Now, there's a there was a there was a clip I played earlier in the week from um uh, Dr. Uh, Carol Anderson. Dr. Carol Anderson is a historian, professor of African American history at uh, Emory University. And she did an interview with two white parents in Georgia, two white parents in Georgia who were interviewing her about critical race theory, what it is and what it isn't. I'm going to share an excerpt from that interview is very informative and she deals with a lot of history as well and it's a lot of history that uh people don't know but governor tate reeves so we see more and more anti-critical race theory laws being passed in these uh, uh re republican controlled state legislatures and when you talk to some of these people that are sponsoring the bills and voting for these bills and you ask them what critical race theory is Nine times out of 10, they can't even tell you what critical race theory is. And critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools either. Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves, Republican, of course, signed a bill on Monday, uh, March 14th, 2022, to limit how race can be used in uh, classrooms 
and it became law immediately. Contrary, he said, contrary to what some critics may claim, this bill in no way, in no shape, and in no form prohibits the teaching of history. Now, I'm going to let you hear what Governor Tate Reed had to say. Now, I'm only going to play about two minutes of it because it's so stupid. I, I, I can't tolerate the full five minutes of it. I have a low tolerance for nonsense. Uh, this is Senate Bill 2113. And the bill says it would prohibit critical race theory. But the main text of the legislation does not mention critical race theory. And most of these idiots that voted for the bill can't tell you what critical race theory is. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, March 20th, 2022. First day of spring. We made it through, finally. Made it through the winter. Uh, the day is the vernal equinox. Uh, the day we have the same amount of daylight as nighttime. So uh, I, I'm going to go to this clip here in um, just a minute, Jalen, here from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered. But we talked about this. Uh, so a lot of people have heard about the Crown Act, right? And um, it, it passed the House of Representatives on uh, Friday passed the House of Representatives on Friday by a vote of 235 to 189. And what's interesting is there were only 14 Republicans in the House of Representatives that voted for the bill. OK, so um, I, I'm, we're going to go to this and break down exactly what this does. It still has to pass the Senate. You're going to need 20. You're going to need 10 Republicans in the Senate to uh vote for the bill all right you're going to need 10 republicans in the senate because most bills in the senate require 60 votes not 50. so uh we're going to have to push this through uh also okay uh i just sent that to you jay we're going to go to clip number one from nbc news here and then uh we'll go to the clip from roland martin unfiltered all right so if we look at the uh crown act here uh, NBC News has a good article on this and also um, Washington Post as well. House passes a Crown Act banning discrimination against black hairstyles. Now, Crown is an acronym. Crown stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. The Crown Act prohibits discrimination based on an individual's texture or style of hair. So uh, the House of Representatives on Friday, March uh, 18th, 2022, passed a Crown Act, which would ban hair-related discrimination. The measure, which is H.R. 2116, passed by a vote of 235 to 189, 235 to 189, uh, along party lines. It was largely along party, party lines, okay? It was uh, introduced by Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, uh, who's uh, also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, African-American woman, Bonnie Watson Coleman, uh, Democrat of New Jersey. Now, Crown, uh, as I said, stands for uh, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And the act prohibits discrimination based on an individual's texture or style of hair. The bill now goes uh, to the Senate. The legislation states that routinely people of African descent deprived of educational and employment opportunities for wearing their hair in natural or protective hairstyles, such as locks, cornrows, twists, braids, bantu knots, or afros. Here we are, uh, so uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman said, we are today standing on behalf of those individuals, whether my colleagues on the other side recognize it or not, who are discriminated against as children in school 
as adults who are trying to get jobs, individuals who are trying to get housing, individuals who simply want, want access to public accommodations and to be beneficiaries of federally funded programs. Now, I want to go to uh, clip number one here. This is from uh, NBC News. They're talking about the bill right after it passed. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. It's a big deal. A lot of people, I mean, and it's, it's, it's not going unnoticed, the significance of this moment on the Hill. That's right, Hallie. Supporters of this bill are saying that for decades, African Americans have been discriminated against for the style of their hair, the texture of their hair, and they've had to conform to what they call white beauty standards for jobs, for educational opportunities, having uh, to wear wigs or chemically treat and damage their hair. And this really struck a chord with lawmakers on the House floor today, who some got emotional talking about their personal experiences. Listen to what Congresswoman Cori Bush had to say. As a black woman who loves my braids, I know what it's like to feel isolated because of how I wear my hair. This is the last time we say no more to black people being demeaned and discriminated against for the same hairstyles that corporations profit from. And Congresswoman Gwen Moore said uh, she recalled a, a, an experience for applying for a job opportunity. She said if someone had told a previous employer that she was, quote, an embarrassment because of the way she wore her hair. Another Congresswoman, Bonnie Watson, who was a Congresswoman who actually introduced this bill, talked about her personal experiences. And she said it's just simple discrimination against blacks based on their hair texture, their hairstyles, is discrimination against blacks in general. Uh, she said that that is why she's pushing for this bill to pass. Okay. So that was a uh, good reporting from uh, NBC news the best they could. Uh, that was good reporting from NBC news. So uh, Washington post also has a good article on this as well. And uh, the piece from the Washington post house passes crown act banning discrimination against black hairstyles house passes crown act banning discrimination against black hairstyles we're going to clip number two from roland martin unfiltered here in just a second Jalen. uh during debate on the house floor friday morning uh march 18th democrats argue that the bill addresses a kitchen table issue for black americans for african americans this is a picture of bonnie watson coleman as well uh the house on friday passed the crown act legislation that would end discrimination against individuals based on how they chose to wear their hair this is bill 2116 14 republicans voted no okay uh out of over 200 republicans 14 voted no now go to congress.gov uh one of them was um uh jim jordan idiotic jim jordan out of uh, ohio but go to congress.gov and you can look up the names of the uh i'm sorry only 14 only 14 republicans voted for the bill i should say only 14 republicans voted to, to support the bill 189 republicans voted against the bill um so the overwhelming majority of republicans voted against this bill the legislation was introduced by representative bonnie watson coleman that prohibits discrimination based on the individual's hair texture or hairstyle if that hair texture or that hairstyle is commonly associated with a particular race or national origin okay uh i want to go to uh this next clip here so i was a panelist on roland martin unfiltered on friday uh march 18th and i'm usually a panelist on each friday and um we discussed uh this bill let's go to uh clip two uh Jaylen. almost called you roland <laughs> Uh, folks, creating respectful and open world for natural hair, known as the Crown Act, passed the House today. Uh, the measure passed the Democratic-led House, 235 to 189. The bill seeks to protect against bias based on hair texture and protective styles, including locks, cornrows, twists, braids, uh, bantu knots, and afros. During the floor debate, Representative Ayanna Presley explained how black hair has a place in society. Or the House of Representatives, the People's House, to declare that black girls with our braids, locks, afros, all forms of natural hairstyles, and yes, even our smooth, alopecia, bald heads belong everywhere. 
Today, we take an important step towards codifying this fact into law by passing the Crown Act legislation. I'm so proud to co-lead in partnership with Representatives Watson Coleman, Moore, Lee, and Omar. For too long, black girls have been discriminated against and criminalized for the hair that grows on our heads and the way we move through and show up in this world. In my home state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, two twin sisters, Deanna and Maya, high school students, were disciplined for showing up with braids. They were given numerous detentions, kicked off the track team, banned from prom solely for their hairstyle. In their own words, these scholars and athletes were judged more for their heritage than their homework. No more. For those sisters and thousands of other students who face discrimination based on their hair, the Crown Act is for you. For recent graduates who fear they must change their hair or cut their locks to secure a job, the Crown Act is for you. For our elders who have faced and fought this racism for generations, the Crown Act is for you. Just yesterday, the Massachusetts State Legislature made history by passing similar legislation. By passing the Crown Act today, we affirm, say it loud, black is beautiful and so is our hair. Whether you are a student in a classroom, an employee in the workplace, or the next Supreme Court Justice or the Speaker Pro Tem, you deserve to show up as your full self, rocking your crown with your head held high. I urge a yes vote for every person who has been asked to shrink or to apologize simply for the beautiful way with which God made them. I yield back. The bill now heads to the Senate where Democratic Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey has sponsored the chamber's version of the bill. The thing that's interesting here, of course, uh, Kelly, is that when this first came up, they wanted to unanimous consent, uh, did not get two thirds of the votes, but Republicans uh, uh, would move on that. But th the nonsensical comments that we heard from the right, um, oh, Black folks, here are black people playing the victim again. We don't need a bill when it comes to hair. Then you had folks like uh, Burgess Owens, uh, when it first happened, uh, the black Republican out of Utah, uh, say, oh, this well, a business should have every right to tell people how to wear their hair. It's their business. And you make it sound like black people don't have businesses. I'm like, dude, you sound like a damn idiot. I mean, white people don't know what it's like to be discriminated against because of their hair. It's, it's just that plain and simple. But they, they damn sure not... know how to discriminate based upon hair. Exactly. You know, I can't tell you the amount of times I've had to, you know, suppress a panic attack because, you know, whether I'm, you know, getting interviewed for a job that I really like and I wasn't able to flat iron my hair that day or, you know, if I'm going somewhere, should I? We're going to pause it right there, uh, back it up about 20 seconds or so, Jalen. We're going to continue this on the other side of the break. You're going to hear what I had to say. Also, we're going to talk about the 1786 Tion Law in Louisiana. That was a law that mandated that Creole slave women and free women had to wear head wraps to cover their hair so they would not be attractive to white men. We're going to continue this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. The Business Scaling Challenge is a seven day online event that is taking place the week of March 13th through March 19th, 2022. This challenge will guide a group of business owners through scaling their businesses. Business owner Ronnie Sumler is hosting the Business Scaling Challenge in remembrance and honor of her father, the late civil rights activist Rodney Sumler. 
He helped a lot of African-American-owned businesses and local community leaders participate in politics. However, when he passed away, all of his ventures died with him. This inspired his daughter, Ronnie Sumler, to help community business owners preserve their businesses. Her business, Digital Dandelions, offers business Bibles to record business processes and procedures. Their business Bibles are their branded run of show business manuals that have everything you need to run your business in one place. Their business scaling kit is the first step in creating a business Bible. It includes everything needed to grow your business in one place. Join the Business Scaling Challenge Facebook group for more information and good luck in scaling your business. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 20th, 2022, and we are live. Uh, calling numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600. Is to call in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, be sure to uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the online history classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. On Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Next class is uh, Saturday, March 26, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then uh, on Sundays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We had uh, two great classes this weekend. As soon as you register, you can watch uh, those classes. They're archived. We do them live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. Uh, the classes on sale. The classes are on sale. Sixty dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. And we have a bundle pack where you can get both classes for only one hundred dollars. That's a two hundred sixty dollar value. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past. Email me at AHN show at African History Network dot com for 50 percent discount. Email me at AHN show at African History Network dot com for 50 percent discount. OK, uh, so right before the break, we, I was sharing an excerpt from Roland Martin Unfiltered when I was on Friday. My panelists usually each Friday. And we were talking about the um, U.S. House of Representatives passing the Crown Act. OK, on uh, Friday, March 18th, they passed the uh, Crown Act, which bans discrimination against um, black hairstyles, against African-American hairstyles. And Crown uh, is an acronym that stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. Uh, call in numbers 313-778-7600. If you have a question or comment, 313-778-7600. If you have a question or comment, uh, I want to go back to that clip. Let's go back to the clip, Jalen. Apologize simply for the beautiful way with which God made them. I yield back. The bill now heads to the Senate where Democratic Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey has sponsored the chamber's version of the bill. The thing that's interesting here, of course, uh, Kelly, is that when this first came up, they wanted the unanimous consent. Uh, did not get two thirds of the votes, but Republicans uh, uh, would move on that. But th the nonsensical comments that we heard from the right um, oh, black folks, here are black people playing the victim again. We don't need a bill when it comes to hair. Then you had folks like uh, Burgess Owens uh, when it first happened, uh, the black Republican out of Utah, uh, say, oh, this well, a business should have every right to tell people how to wear their hair. It's their business, and you make it sound like black people don't have businesses. I'm like, dude, you sound like a damn idiot. I mean, white people don't know what it's like to be discriminated against because of their hair. It's, it's just that plain and simple. Well, they, they damn sure not... know how to discriminate based upon hair. Exactly. You know, I can't tell you the amount of times I've had to you know, suppress a panic attack because, you know, whether I'm, you know, getting interviewed for a job that I really like and I wasn't able to flat iron my hair that day, or, you know, if I'm going somewhere, should I have, can I wear it out? Can do I have to have it in a ponytail? Do I need a wig? What have you? And 
white people do not understand the stress of having to modify themselves in order to be accepted in the world as they are. Black women only know how to do that. You know, so this this legislation is incredibly powerful um, and also kind of bittersweet because at the same time, you are not your hair. You know, I did not my hair did not get me my college degree. My hair did not get me my job. My hair did not get me into the rooms that I have been in. However, it has kept me out of rooms because of other people's biases. <clears throat> so this legislation will help prevent stuff like that and actually take into account the wholeness of Black women and other um, women of color who have curly hair or hair that is just not, frankly, white hair. Because it's not even good or bad hair. It's either white hair or not white hair. Check this and, out. Uh, he, and that is the, that's the frustration of it. Here are two white men on the floor of the House with no hair uh, discussing the Crown Act. Listen. just as good a human being and, just, and I'm just as good a human being and just as smart and just as effective and just as caring with or without hair. And the fact is, it's discrimination and it's ignorance. And African Americans have been discriminated against in many ways because of their, their hairstyle. It's a natural thing for African Americans and they should not be penalized in their workplace, in sports, in school or in any other ways. So I stand here for the Crown Act. It was in, originally introduced, I think, by Cedric Richmond. And I joined with him on the Judiciary Committee to support it. I'd seen problems in Tennessee when I was a state senator and supported bills there to protect people who wore braids and whatever. So I hope the people will rise up, vote yes, and understanding of other people and think beyond themselves. And I'm just real, as good a human being and just as smart. Uh, uh, Matt, uh, how if, if people want to know Republicans don't give a damn about black people, 189 voted against 189 voted against i don't really know what to say beyond they know this is an issue and they don't care jim jordan saying i care about inflation and gas prices and all these other things that are important but this is a perennial <laughs> issue we keep hearing cases around the country of kids especially being discriminated against because of their hair what I think is important is Steny Hoyer says, look, the military last year thought it was appropriate enough to allow people to wear uh, these hairstyles because we don't want discrimination there. So the idea that that shouldn't be uh, expanded to the American people at large is absurd, particularly where we continue seeing high profile cases where especially young people are being discriminated against for uh, hair that is synonymous with their heritage. And that's the thing here. Look, this is a dog whistle, right? Because white people aren't being um, discriminated against for their hairstyles, by and large, the way black people are. So to to uh, go along with what Al Green said, the congressman, you know, the idea that this is not what the American people want excludes black people from the American people. And, the, and black people are unfortunately continuing to be discriminated against because of our hairstyles. So I think the Republicans don't care. They're signaling that to us. Um, and I think that the fact that this continues happening you know, belies why it should be addressed through legislation. So and I'm glad if, they've done so. If you want to see dumbasses, uh, let's see, look at the dumbasses in the White House uh, press corps. This literally, this literally was a question uh, that was asked today by one of these idiots in the White House press corps. Listen to this. About that. And then I have, like, a fun Friday question. Okay. okay. <laughs> the House passed the Crown Act, which bans discrimination based on hairstyle. Mm -hmm. Is this something the administration supports? Would they sign it into law if the Senate passed it? I have seen that. I have not talked to our legislative team about it. I'm happy to do that, and we'll see if we can get you a fun, fun, fun Friday answer back. Go ahead. About see, Roland, this... This is this is an attack on white standards of beauty. And this and, and, and you have this is why so many Republicans voted against it, including re black Republicans who think white like Burgess Owens, former NFL player. He could have CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He may be somehow related to Herschel Walker. I wouldn't be surprised. Both of them dumb as hell. OK, both of them are uh, uh, white supremacy <laughs> through ventriloquism, as uh, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson would say. But if you, it, it, this is also an economic issue, okay? Because what happens is discriminating against African-Americans, men or women, 
based upon the type of hairstyles, natural hairstyles, braids, things like this, this also helps to lock us out of certain jobs, certain positions, things like this. So this is also an economic issue. And if you look at what Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey said uh, today, she said, natural black hair is often deemed, quote unquote, unprofessional simply because it does not conform to white beauty standards, okay? In fact, uh, uh, in fact this... uh, hold that right there. We're gonna okay. play her comments, go. Oh, well, I was just going to finish. No, 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 hold on. Oh, of I'm those sorry. individuals, whether my colleagues on the other side recognize it or not, are discriminated against as children in school, as adults who are trying to get jobs, as individuals who are trying to get housing, of individuals who simply want access to affordable uh, to uh, public accommodations and to be beneficiaries of federally funded programs. And why are they denied? these opportunities because there are folks in this society who get to make those decisions who think because your hair is kinky, it is braided, it is in knots, or it is not straight and blonde and light brown, that you somehow are not worthy of access to those issues. Well, that's discrimination. There is no logical reason that anyone should be discriminated against on any level because of the texture of their hair or the style of their hair. This bill is vitally important. It is important to the young girls and the young boys who have to cut their hair in the middle of a uh, wrestling match in front of everyone because some white referee says that your hair is inappropriate to, to uh, engage in your match. That young man engaged in his match and he won it. It's inappropriate for our girls to be sent home disciplined or pushed out simply because they've got braids in their hair. And it doggone sure is discriminatory to deny someone employment, housing, or public accommodations because of the way they're wearing their hair. That's why we're standing here today. It is unfortunate that we have to, but we do. And with that in mind, I thank the chairman of the Judiciary Committee for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of a bill that I think is vitally important, that represents movement and understanding in the 21st century what discrimination can look like and what it can do to people. That was Congresswoman uh, Bonnie Coleman uh, of uh, New Jersey. Bonnie Watsi Coleman. Uh, Mike, go ahead. All right, pa pause right there. Okay, well, these he commercials killing me. All right, we're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation and Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read eBooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 20th, 2022. 
It is the first day of spring. It is the vernal equinox. Uh, CNN.com has a good article dealing with the vernal equinox and uh, the, the day of the year. We have the same amount of daylight as uh, sunlight. Uh, check this out. Uh, we're going to pull this up here from uh, CNN.com. I talked about this in my online class, uh, my online history class today, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So spring is here at last. Spring, uh, spring equinox 2022, March 20th. Uh, so we know that um, Easter is coming soon. Easter, Easter, Oyster, Ishtar, all those names are connected. Um, spring equinox 2022 at last, the first day of spring. And if we look at the very quickly here, the etymology of the word, uh, equinox precisely when will the spring equinox happen? They break it down based upon time zones. Um, in Illinois, uh, and Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica, 10 33 a.m. Illinois is central standard time, if I remember correctly, because we're eastern standard time here in Detroit. Um, but if you look at the etymology, and I, and I talk about the lectures dealing with the history of uh, Easter, spring equinox has another name, vernal equinox. Now, vernal is Latin for spring. Vernal is Latin for spring. And the term equinox comes from the Latin word uh, equinoxium. You will also see the word aquanatium, but it means equality. Uh, it means equality between day and night. And vernal also comes from the Latin a word uh, which means spring. Okay, so check out more information on this dealing with the vernal equinox. Now, Easter comes. Easter comes on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. What determines when Easter is celebrated is based upon astronomy. Easter always occurs on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. Okay, so Easter is coming soon. All right, Easter, Easter, Oyster, Ishtar. Well, um, you know, we'll talk when I did my presentation, when we did our show on Thursday, March 17th, dealing with uh, St. Patrick, uh, should African Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day? And uh, we, we talked about St. Patrick was a mass murderer who killed thousands of Irish. Uh, he was sent in to Ireland in 432 AD by Pope Celestine I to convert the Irish to um, Christianity. And uh, he killed thousands of uh, Druids, Irishmen, you know, trying to convert them, convert the Irish to Christianity. And we talked about was uh, Patrick a saint or a criminal. So uh, go back and watch that show. Uh, we had a lot of information uh, on that one. OK, I want to go back to this clip here. Uh, this is from uh, Roland Martin and Filtered. Uh, I was a panelist on Friday. And we were talking about the Crown Act, the Crown Act. Okay, let's go back to this clip, Jalen. Because of the way they're wearing their hair. That's why we're standing here today. It is unfortunate that we have to, but we do. And with that in mind, I thank the chairman of the Judiciary Committee for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of a bill that I think is vitally important, that represents movement and understanding in the 21st century what discrimination can look like and what it can do to people. Uh, that was Congresswoman uh, Bonnie Coleman uh, of uh, New Jersey, Bonnie Watsi Coleman. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Right. You know, she she said it perfectly, brother. And, and, and I quote, you know, our Grandmaster Scholar Warrior, Dr. Wade Nobles, power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. And these these Republicans, these white Republicans and their Negro allies in, in the House saw their power slipping away. And that's what this is about. This is this is this is a powerful bill. And we have to push this through the Senate as well. Well, but this is this is an example of how elections have consequences also. Well, and, an and, and again, the, the thing here that people don't understand, and black people, we get it, but what you got is you got these white folks, Kelly, who have a, a, a clue, no clue. I remember several years ago uh, going to the EEOC website, and there was a black woman who had applied to be a psychiatrist uh, at a VA hospital in Virginia. Impeccable credentials, okay? While the committee, when she left the room, the white man on the committee, mm, I'm not so sure about her hairstyle. She didn't get the job. She eventually sued, won, 
They had to pay back, they had to pay back wages and to give her the job. So it wasn't the resume. It wasn't the expertise. It wasn't the education. He did not like her hairstyle. And, and, it, cost, money, and it cost taxpayers. And that's my thing. All of that money could have been with taxpayers and to the appropriated, um, you know, appropriately, <clears throat> as opposed to going to this woman who, frankly, was minding her business and just trying to do her job. So all of this goes back to, frankly, just minding your business and stop, you know, projecting what you think standard is, what you think appropriate is, especially when you don't have the cultural wherewithal and nuance and knowledge to to really decipher exactly how important a Black woman's hair is. You know, that is a cultural thing. That is a an ancestral thing. And for you to not understand that, that's okay. But just mind your business in doing so. Let me wear my hair the way that I want to. Let me express myself through my hair as I want to. Because again, like I said before, my profession has nothing to do with my hairstyle. My hairstyle did not get me into my profession. My hairstyle is not going to help you in, in, in the work that I do. But my skill set will, you know, my networking will, everything else besides my hair, frankly, will. So again, it's a matter of minding your business and stop projecting your insecurities onto other people. And, of course, um, sitting in the chair um, holding the gavel today was Congresswoman Gwen Moore of Wisconsin, um, appropriately, uh, rocking her natural hair uh, as she uh, gaveled the bill. Watch this. On this vote, the yeas are 235, and the nays are 189. With no one answering present, res the respecting, the creating a respectful and open world for Natural Hair Act is passed. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Well, that was certainly uh, apropos, um, Matt, as a uh, civil rights attorney. Uh, when you listen to the different members uh, stand up and they talked about different cases, when you listen to uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of uh, Massachusetts talk about uh, what uh, black girls and black boys have had to go through. We all remember uh, that, um, uh, that video, uh, we all remember that video, if you will, of the brother who was a wrestler. Well, the referee mm -hmm. said, oh, unless you cut his hair, he's going to lose the match. Not a damn thing to do with his physical ability. Nothing to do with physical ability, but it was really just about his hair. That is the level of hatred that you see. And somebody posted this, if you go to my computer, uh, they actually posted, they wanted to know all of the people <coughs> uh, who voted uh, nay. Uh, and of course, mm -hmm. it's Republicans. So when you go down this list, so when y'all see this right here, uh, when you go down this list, uh, when, you see, when you see all of these nays here, uh, these are uh, Republicans. Uh, you know, I see Kay Granger, the former mayor of Fort Worth, uh, on here. Uh, I see uh, Dan Crenshaw of Texas, Texas Hal Rogers, Texas. Uh, Chip Roy. Uh, it goes Mo Brooks of Alabama, all these Republicans. And so I, I just want people, that fool Louis Gomer, uh, Ronnie Jackson, that fool uh, Daryl, that fool uh, from um, uh, uh, Texas, used to be uh, Trump's doctor. Uh, you see his name on here as well. I mean, y'all need to see, it, it, again, if y'all, when all these black Republicans roll up in here and we talk about how the Republican Party don't like black people, Dara mm -hmm. Issa's name uh, is on here. Steve Scalise voted against. Maria Salazar voted against. Just so y'all clear, Andy Biggs of Alabama, you saw his name <laughs> voting against. 189 voted against. So, when you hear us say the black, black Republic, the Republican Party don't give a damn about black people, this bill is a perfect example, Matt. Yep, it's part and parcel with what they do in every aspect and when it comes to dealing with black Americans, dealing with race and dealing with historical inequities. I mean, look, after my first year of law school, I cut my locks because I was afraid I wouldn't get a job. And I've regretted it ever since. But the fact that I even had to think about that is proof positive that this is a seminal issue and an issue that continues coming up. 
And it's an issue that we know um, we've seen play out on the national scale. I mean, the fact that this young man is having to cut his hair to compete in a wrestling match that he ultimately wins shows that the prowess is in, or rather, he has the prowess to win. It's not about his hair. So Republicans keep telling us that, um, and sometimes we don't listen, but this is another thing that shows that uh, they don't care. And in fact, one of the things that I think some of the opponents were saying is that, oh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act covers this, but we know we know that it's not strong enough because we need specific legislation considering how often this happens and how often we're having to discuss these issues, protect, particularly with young people who are being discriminated against. Again, um, hey. you know, when, when, when we look at, again, who votes, who doesn't, mm -hmm. all y'all folks who say, man, this stuff don't matter, uh, it does matter. Because here's the other piece. If Democrats right. did, listen to me, folks, clearly, if Democrats did not control the U.S. House, this bill does not get passed. Now the right. question is, are we going to see 10 Republicans have the guts to support this bill, and then will Democrats actually go ahead and pass it uh, by breaking the filibuster? That's what we'll see. Michael, go ahead. Uh, very quickly, uh, I wanted to say uh, quickly two things. I, I encourage everybody to go to congress.gov, congress.gov. Look up these bills, like the Crown Act, because at congress.gov, you can see who voted for the bills and who voted against the bills. If your member of the House keeps voting for bills that you advocate for, you got to rally to vote them back into office. If your member of the House and Senate keep voting against bills that you advocate for, regardless of whether they're Democrats or Republicans, you got to vote them out of office. And then you mentioned Chip Roy at Texas. Chip Roy also voted against, he was one of the three Republicans in the House who voted against the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill as well. Okay? And, and when you go read Chip Roy's statements, and, we, and BlackAmericaWeb.com has an article about this, he talked about uh, how... Uh, Lynching is a metaphor for justice. He's from Texas. He talked about how lynching is a metaphor for justice. These are some sick people that have to be dealt with and voted out of office. Absolutely. And so, uh, and uh, again, we were sitting here looking. Uh, if you are in North Carolina and you live in the 7th District, this guy right here, mm -hmm. member of Congress, he voted against that. I keep telling y'all, if, if the Republicans out there voting against black folks, Throw them out. Um, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021, and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human, were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis's books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One, they solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing costs, which can be thousands of dollars. They close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing. They take the property in an as-is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs. 
Give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs. Call them at 973-475-8488. That's 973-475-8488. Visit their website, AbundantCapitalGroup.com. That's AbundantCapitalGroup.com. And email them at ACG at AbundantCapitalGroup.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Abundant Capital Group. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. All right. We are celebrating our 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. I first broadcasted March 10th, 2010. March 10th, 2010. It's been 12 years. It's gone by quickly. Um, if you'd like to stop with information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AH engine. It says, let's keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, et cetera, pay for all these services I use uh, as well. Uh, and we also have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. Um, and we have the uh, Cash App information and PayPal. You can also register for the online courses that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays um, at our website as well. The classes are on sale $60, regularly $130 on on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'af for understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. If you missed the class we did on Saturday 19, as soon as you register, you can watch that class and you can join us in class on March 26th. And then, uh, because we do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived and recorded even after the 10 week online courses over we can watch the full class you'll still have full access on sundays i teach from the civil war to the civil rights movement of black power 1865 to 1968 that's 2 p.m to 4 p.m as well we have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes for only a hundred dollars that's a 260 dollars value if you've taken any of my classes in the past email me at uh ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com and we'll give you a 50 percent discount on the uh, course bundle all right i want to go back to um this story we were talking about um in the first hour here and we ran into some technical difficulties um on friday march 18th i was on roland martin as filtered we talked about the crown act has passed the house of representatives by a vote of 235 to 189 now only 14 republicans voted for this bill even Bert Burgess Owens, who's an African American Republican, brain damaged Burgess Owens, he voted against the bill. But Burgess Owens, I mean, he's talking about brain damaged Negroes. Burgess Owens testified at two House hearings, House of Representative hearings on reparations. Burgess Owens testified against African Americans getting reparations. And he's African American, Republican from Utah talk about stuck on stupid brain damage okay but elections have consequences all right so um the crown act uh stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair now this does not this does not just apply to employment opportunities this implies to going to school uh educational opportunities all different types of things like this the legislation states that routinely people of african descent are deprived of educational and employment opportunities. Routinely, people of African descent are deprived of educational and employment opportunities for wearing their hair in a natural or protective uh, hairstyles, such as locks, cornrows, twists, braids, bantu knots, or afros. And uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman uh, spoke on the House floor as well. And uh, you heard the uh, clip of Bonnie Watson Coleman. She said, here we are today standing on behalf of those individuals, whether my colleagues on the other side recognize it or not. She's talking about Republicans in the House who are discriminated against as children, as adults who are trying to get jobs, individuals who are trying to get housing, individuals who simply want access to public accommodations and to be beneficiaries of federally funded programs so this has this has wide-ranging 
economic implications as well right there. Give us a call. 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call and number. If you have a question or comment, that's David Ruzer, R-O-U-Z-E-R, congressman from North Carolina, 7th district, 7th congressional district. He voted against the bill. 189 Republicans voted against the bill. Okay. Now you have some people who don't follow politics think this is a waste of time and resources that means you didn't read any of these articles haven't paid attention to any of this stuff okay and if it was a waste of time why did republicans vote against the bill this is what happens when you have no clue what you're talking about and you come here with social media talking points you got from dumbasses on social media i, I mentioned in that clip i mentioned uh hang em high chip roy republican from texas sitting member of the house of representatives in texas chip roy who was one of the three Republicans in the House of Representatives that voted against the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. Now, when we talked about the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill passing the House and the Senate, we talked about that here on this show. I showed you this article here from blackamericaweb.com. Hang them high, Republican, who voted against the Till bill called lynching, quote, a metaphor for justice. You guessed it, he's a white man. OK, not not some. I mean, this is not an attack on white men. Some of my best friends are white men. But what I'm saying is this right here. OK, needs to be voted out of office. There's a lot of white men who voted for the anti lynching, the Emmett Till anti lynching bill. It got unanimous support in the Senate and it got I think it was like four hundred and thirty five. Was it four thirty five? And no, it was um, four. It was four hundred four hundred something in the House. I forgot what the it got unanimous support from Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives. But hang them high, Chip Roy. It was 422 to 3. 422 to 3 in the House. There's only 435 members in the House. 422 to 3 in the House of Representatives. Okay. Hang them high, Chip Roy. But look at some of his comments. Okay. Now, Texas, keep in mind, Texas had the third highest number of lynchings in the country from 1882 to 1968. Texas had 493 lynchings from 1868. Mississippi was number one with uh, Mississippi had 581. Mississippi had 581 lynchings. Okay, so he said that he was pro, he said he's pro-police. Um, he's injustice. Chip Roy said in reference to people from Texas, he said there's an old saying in Texas about find all the rope in Texas and get a tall oak tree. He said, you know, we we take justice very seriously and we ought to, we take justice very seriously and we ought to do that, round up the bad guys. That's what we believe, okay? So then he said he's pro-police, he's pro-law enforcement. I'm pro-taking out the bad guys, hang them high. Chip Roy said about lynching. Now, he all but shrugged when asked about America's history of lynching African-Americans. Chip Roy responded, yes, yeah, so? He said, quote, it was a metaphor for justice. Now, this is a sitting member of Congress, Republican, who also supported, you know, he Trump supporter, who is advocating for extrajudicial uh Extra, judi extra judicial measures. Clearly, Chip Roy's views about lynchings, from which his state was responsible for hundreds of instances, 493 from 1882 to 1968, according to the uh, information NAACP has at their website. According to the lynching in Texas website, according to the lynching in Texas website, there were more than 600 lynchings in the Lone Star State from 1882 to 1945. For, for that one, there's another report that shows Texas had 493 from 1882 to 1968. The NAACP puts lynchings in their proper historical perspective. Okay, we'll deal with this on the other side of the break. We'll talk about also the Tion Laws of 1786 in Louisiana that forced African women to cover their hair so they would not be attractive to white men. It didn't work. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. 
What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future of radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. All right, so right before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, the House of Representatives passed the Crown Act, uh, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. I shared an excerpt from Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, when I was on Friday, March 18th. We talked about the Crown Act. Um, we were talking about this piece here from blackamericaweb.com because Chip Roy, who was one of the 189 Republicans uh, who voted against the Crown Act in the House of Representatives, hang em high Chip Roy, Republican from Texas, was also one of three Republicans in the House of Representatives who voted against the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill, okay, that passed the House uh, by a vote of 422 to 3, and we know it passed the U.S. Senate unanimously. But uh, the NAACP put lynchings in their proper historical perspective, and NAACP has a section on their uh, national website that deals with the history of lynchings. A typical lynching involved a criminal accusation and an arrest and the assembly of a mob followed by seizure, physical torment, and murder of the victim. Lynchings were often public spectacles attended by the white community, oftentimes with their children, in celebration of white supremacy. Photos of lynchings were often sold as souvenir postcards. Photos of lynchings were often sold as souvenir postcards. Now, we know the bill was sponsored by Representative Bobby Rush, member of the Congressional Black Caucus, former member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, who introduced the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, and he posted on Twitter to say he was not surprised that Hang 'em High Chip Roy was among the three Republicans who voted against the bill, okay? Representative Bobby Rush tweeted, who were the three votes against the Anti-Lynching Act tonight? Andrew Clyde of Georgia, called the, the Andrew Clyde called the January 6th insurrection a normal tourist visit. Thomas Massey, good old Thomas Massey, who, who took a very heartwarming uh, Christmas picture and put it on Christmas cards with he and his family with guns and assault rifles, things like this. That's Thomas Massey out of Kentucky. Good old great American Thomas Massey. He wrote a bill to allow guns in school zones. What a, you know, what, what a great guy he is, Thomas Massey. And then you have Hang 'em High Chip Roy, who called lynching an example of justice. OK. Uh, and and, and uh, Bobby Rush said all Republicans surprised. So uh, check out the rest of this uh, article here. We talked about it bef uh, before here on the show. Um, Hang 'em High Republican who voted against. Emmett Till bill called lynching a metaphor for justice. Huh. Okay. All right. So the uh, also NAACP.org has um, information dealing with the history of lynchings, the official website. They have a section. Uh, if you just go to NAACP.org and search for lynchings, it will it will come up with this here. History of lynching in America. White Americans used lynching to terrorize and control black people in the 19th and 20th centuries. Learn more about the history of this barbaric practice and how NAACP, how the NAACP worked to end lynching. Now, we know the NAACP was formed in 1909 um, after the Springfield, Illinois race riot of 1908, and they were formed coming out of the Niagara movement. And they were formed partly to fight against lynchings. 
we know it was in 1917 that James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP uh, organized the silent march in 1917 when you had 10,000 African Americans marching down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan demanding uh, federal anti-lynching laws. Uh, and this was after the East St. Louis, Illinois uh, race riot of 1917, okay? And here's a picture of the um, uh, silent march of 1917. This is a piece from blackpast.org, P-A-S-T, atlantablackstar.com has an article about this. Uh, there's a number of sources. New York City NAACP silent protest parade, 1917. You had 10,000 African Americans marching down Fifth Avenue demanding a federal anti-lynching bill, okay? And it took, uh, the Congress has tried over 200 times to get an anti-lynching bill passed. They finally got it done. All right, so, uh, but very quickly here, it talks about from uh, the NAACP's website, how many people were lynched? From 1882 to 1968, there were 4,743 recorded lynchings in the U.S., okay? Uh, this is according to records maintained by the NAACP. Other accounts, including the Equal Justice Initiative's extensive, re extensive report on lynching, count slightly different numbers, but it's impossible to know for certain how many lynchings occurred because there was no formal tracking. Many historians believe the true number is underreported. The highest number of lynchings during that time period, 1882 to 1968, Mississippi, Surprise, 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 had 581 recorded lynchings. Nina Simone wrote a song about Mississippi also. Go look that up. Georgia, where Andrew Clyde is, who voted against the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill, one of the three Republicans. Georgia had 531 recorded lynchings. Texas, where good old Chip Roy, the chipster is from, had 493 recorded lynchings. Okay. Um, now, now also you had, um, not just after, even though 72% of people lynched were African Americans, you had white Republicans lynched. There were 1,297 white people lynched from 1882 to 1967. You had white Republicans lynched. You had Mexicans, Chinese, Australia, uh, people from Australia, but the brunt of it was against African Americans. So check this out at, uh, NAACP.org. Okay. Now the, uh, Tion laws tie into the Crown Act laws, uh, it's tie into the Crown Act. So this goes back to 1786 in um, Louisiana, all right? And this is a piece from facetofaceafrica.com, but also Essence Magazine has an article uh, dealing with this as well. Tion laws, T-I-G-N-O-N, it's pronounced Tion. Um, the dreadful rule that banned black women from displaying their hair. The dreadful rule that banned black women from displaying their hair. Now, this is by uh, Farida Dawkins, February 5th, 2018, for uh, face2faceafrica.com. And what's going to happen is um, this is going to be a law targeting African American women, African women, to uh make them less attractive to white men so if we look here um a tion is a headdress pronounced uh, it's t-i-g-n-o-n but it's pronounced t-i-y-n-o-n a tion is a headdress used to conceal hair it was adorned by free and slave women of african ancestry in louisiana in 1786 the sumptuary uh, law was enacted under Governor Esteban Rodriguez, Rodriguez Miro, M-I-R-O. The regulation was meant as a means to regulate the style of dress and appearance of people of color. The regulation in Louisiana was meant as a means to regulate the style of dress and appearance for people of color. Now, this is before the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, before Louisiana becomes part of the Union. Um, black women's features often attracted male white French, uh, black women's features often attracted male white French and Spanish suitors, 
and their beauty was perceived a threat to white women. The Tian tactic, the Tian tactic, the, the Tian law, I should say, was a tactic used to combat the men pursuing and engaging in affairs with Creole women. Translation, this is to keep white men from having sex with black women, African women. This is, this is what this law was, all right? Simply put, black women competed too openly with white women by dressing, dressing elegantly and possessing noteworthy beauty. Now, nonetheless, African women or black women did not despair. Instead, they abided by the rule and turned it into fashion. The women used unique colors, jewels, ribbons, and wrapping styles, which accentuated their beauty, their gorgeousness, even more. Out of this bore the various hair ties seen today on women of color using unique materials, patterns, and flair. Now, it's important to note, African women, you know, historically, African women did have head wraps, gelays. They had, have, this comes from African culture. And we took that culture into wherever we go. We take that, we took our culture with us into areas where we were dispersed. Tions have been worn by women in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean islands of Martinique, Guadalupe, Dominica, which included hidden messages. They used madras, a popular fabric amongst slaves and free women to achieve their head ties. And you see a couple of pictures here. Okay. Now I, I saw I saw a, a quote or something. I, I don't remember exactly who it's from, but it said God was showing out when God made black women. Okay, so I don't know if that's true or not. You can call me and tell me. But <laughs> it's when God when God made black women, God was showing out. Okay, <laughs> I tend to agree. You know, I tend to second that emotion. But still, Tian Law eventually went out of effect in the 1800s. Yet black women worldwide continue to use head wraps as wardrobe staples, paying homage to their culture. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show on Mike Lim Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Stand by. Back from break. Back, back, back from break in four minutes. Stand by. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. My name is Maninkare and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael. I'm Hotep. All right. So right before the break, we were talking about Tion Laws of 1786 in Louisiana. And it's a good article from uh, FaceToFaceAfrica.com. This ties into the Crown Act, which passed the House of Representatives um, March 
uh, 18th, 2022, which dealt with banning discrimination against African-American hairstyles. So if we go back to this uh, piece here from facetofaceafrica.com, um, so the, uh, the Tian law eventually went out of effect in the 1800s, yet black women worldwide continue to use head wraps as wardrobe staples paying homage to their culture signifying their pride and looking stunning while doing so okay now head wraps gelays various types of head wraps come from african culture all right and we take the contrary to proper belief when african people travel when we dis when we were dispersed dispersed when uh we were captured things like this we didn't uh automatically forget what we knew we took those cultures we took those practices and incorporated them into our new uh surroundings into our new circumstances as best we could as much as possible okay so check out this piece here from face to face africa.com tion laws uh the dreadful rule that banned black women from displaying their hair now essence.com also has a piece dealing with this and the article from essence i'm gonna try to pull this up here we're gonna go to that clip i just sent you in just a second Jalen, from uh, msnbc uh this article here from uh essence magazine essence.com is the tion laws set the precedent for the appropriation and misconception around black hair and if we flip over to this here okay how about making us whole in the law i just i don't understand what that means uh you need to clarify that comment okay so this right here uh the tion law set the precedent for the appropriation and misconception around black hair this is from essence.com from um when was this October 24th, 2020. Okay. And it talks about cu cultural appropriation. Um, let me see here. Okay. Hold on. Let me close some of this stuff out. It talks about cultural appropriation and, uh, the Kardashians and the Kim Kardashian as, as, as of present, we can find conversations about what is and what isn't cultural appropriation by way of hair aka kim kardashian and bo derrick was that late 1970s early 1980s bo derrick uh, when she wore cornrows and then white women started wearing cornrows and it was acceptable to some people uh playing out in court about what is and what isn't discrimination based on a hairstyle black hair has always been a topic of conversation okay so then it talks about the tion laws of 1786 most black women can relate to the struggle of getting braids or weave or a weave and having unwanted comments from non-black co-workers even young black girls are subject to ridicule because of their hairstyles the tion laws of 1786 are proof that black hair has always been policed in America, v various ways, uh, various ways. Uh, passed during a time when Creole, mulatto, and women of African descent would adore would adorn their textured hair with gems, beads, and other accents that made them stand out from white women. These laws were designed to regulate our hair. Okay. Um, so you can check out the rest of this, uh, piece also from, um, essence.com. Okay. Now I want to go to, uh, this story here dealing with Brittany Griner. Okay. Uh, the WNBA and we know she was, 
uh, detained in early February 2022 in Russia. Her detention has been extended until uh, May 19th. Okay. Now, ABC News um, has a, a, a story on this. We're going to go to this here in just a second. Um, ABC News has a story on this and, and also on uh, the cross connection with Tiffany Cross. She discussed this as well. So we'll go to that clip in just a minute here. But I want to look first at this piece from um, ABC News. So U.S. officials expressed concern for WNBA star uh, Brittany Griner. OK, because we know that um, because of the invasion of Ukraine that began on February 24th and the day is the 25th day of the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, we know that diplomatic diplomatic relations between the U.S. and uh, Russia are strained, to say the least. They are nowhere near what they normally are. Okay, so Griner has been detained in Russia since mid-February on drug charges. And uh, they have a picture here also of her uh, after detention. Concerns in the U.S. over the well-being of Brittany Griner are growing as Russians extend, as Russia extends the pre-trial detention of the WNBA star. The extension comes amid escalating tensions between the U.S. and Russia, and Russia over the invasion of Ukraine. Now, Russia media, uh, Russian media reported on Thursday that Brittany Griner's pre-trial detention was extended uh, until May 19th by the Kemki court of the Moscow region. The two-time Olympic gold medalist uh, faces drug charges for allegedly smug smuggling hashish oil last month into Russia. Now, Brittany Griner, who's a Houston native, faces up to 10 years in prison, according to uh, Russian media reports. Okay, and she plays for the Phoenix Mercury, for the WNBA. Uh, she was playing for a Russian team. Uh, and she, play, she plays for a Russian team in the offseason. She's been doing that for about the past seven years. Now, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Democrat of Texas, and a member of the House of Representatives, whose district includes parts of Houston, parts of Houston, has called for Brittany Griner's release and told ABC Nightline in an interview on uh, Thursday, March 17th, that she wrote a letter to President Joe Biden and met with him regarding Brittany Griner's case. Quote, I did write a letter uh, to the President of the United States and met with him on this issue of Ms. Griner, again, recognizing the need for privacy and respect of our family members and the need for a genuine, and the need for a genuine support from across the nation, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee said. She went on to say, but I feel that the government is aware and ready to move on helping Brittany. And we are encouraging as a member of Congress to have the government move as swiftly, as profoundly, as strongly as it can do without in any way undermining what is best for Brittany, uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee said. Now, the U.S. State Department issue, issued a statement Friday, uh, Friday, March 18th, uh, demanding access to Brittany Griner. Quote, we are closely engaged on this case and in frequent contact with Brittany Griner's legal team. We insist the Russian government provide consular uh, access to all U.S. citizen to, to all U.S. citizen de detainees in Russia, including those in pretrial detention as Brittany Griner is, the statement said. Okay, now, um, State Department spokesperson Ned Price told ABC News Live on Thursday, March 17th, that U.S. officials have been in constant contact with Brittany Griner's legal team, but are concerned because officials from the U.S. Embassy in Moscow have been unable to meet with uh, Brittany Griner since her detention to evaluate the conditions in which she is being detained and to provide all and to provide all forms of support, end quote. 
Uh, Ned Price went on to say the Russians have not yet permitted us to do so. Um, quote, the Russians are obligated to permit to allow this type of consular access under the Vienna, Con uh, uh, Vienna Convention. We're going to continue to insist that they allow us access to Brittany Griner just as we be permitted access to all Americans who are detained in Russia. Okay, end quote. You can read the rest of this here uh, from uh, ABC News. This is from uh, March 18th, Friday, March 18th, 2022. U.S. officials expressed concern for WNB WNBA star Brittany Griner as Russia extends her detention. Okay, we'll continue this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on that 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. Okay. Um, okay. So somebody asked a question. Okay. I was alluding to the three fifths compromise where every three out of five slaves and slave vote would count. No, that's, that's not even what the three fifths compromise Lord have mercy. That's not what the three fifths compromise was. Um, uh, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution knows the Three-Fifths Compromise was dealing with how to count the population of slaves for the purpose of taxation and apportionment. Apportionment deals with um, determining how many seats in the House of Representatives slaveholding states would have. They were counting three-fifths of the population. Not They were counting three-fifths. If, if, if a state had 100,000 slaves, then how do you count that population when it comes to representation in the House of Representatives? Do you count all 100,000 for, for representation in the House of Representatives? This also counts towards the census as well, but what, what was specifically, do you count half the population? Do you count three quarters of the population? Do you count three fifths of the population? They're going the, the 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 South wants to count the full population. The North is saying the northern states, this is debated at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. The northern states are saying, well, wait a second, if you count the full population, this is going to give you total dominance in the House of Representatives. So they go back and forth trying to figure out how do you count the population of slaves towards representation in the House of Representatives and taxation. They agree to count three fifths of the population. It's not saying that three-fifths of a human being are three-fifths of a person. That's a misinterpretation of uh, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. For the sake of time, read the article from uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Finkelman. This is an extensive article from the root.com uh, called The Three-Fifths Compromise, Why Is Taint Persist? Now, I've interviewed Dr. Paul Finkelman here on the show because he spoke a few years ago at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. And I actually interviewed him here on the show. We talked about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and then this is one of the questions that I asked him. And uh, now, now it's also important to keep in mind the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787 was um, corrected by Article 2, uh, by, by Section 2 of the 14th Amendment of 1868. So that don't even exist. The, 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 the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, he's actually killing me. Three-fifths Compromise of 1787 was corrected by Section 2 of the 14th Amendment of 1868. So that don't even, that don't mean, but the, these are things that we, that I break down in, in my online class, especially from the Civil War to the rights movement in Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay, read this article here, Three-fifths three -fifths Clause, Why Is Taint Persist by Dr. Paul Finkelman, author of about 50 books dealing with history. He's a history professor um, as well. He, he goes through and breaks this down. Okay, uh, let's go to this clip here from, uh, this is from uh, Tiffany Cross's show, The Cross Connection. 
And uh, this is from Saturday, uh, March 19th, dealing with Brittany Griner. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. This is just a call for mercy, a call for justice. Certainly, this must also be said. This can't be about Democrats. This can't be about Republicans. It has to be about bringing Americans home. And that's why it's important the Biden administration and the State Department exhaust every avenue possible to bring Brittany Griner home and all the Americans who are being held in Russia. All right, Americans across the country are rallying for the release of one of the world's best basketball players, that's WNBA star Brittany Griner. She's been in custody in Russia since mid-February on drug charges. Now, a Russian court has extended her detention until May, according to Russian state-run media, and her request to be released into house arrest was denied just this week. In the meantime, activists are pointing out that Griner would never have been in Russia if the WNBA just paid their players fairly. Joining me now to get into all of this is journalist Tamara Sproul. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Court Queens about the WNBA, and happy to have T.J. Quinn. He's an investigative reporter for ESPN. Thank you both for being here. Tamron, I want to start off uh, with you. Um, the petition you started, um, it has over 65,000 signatures. Um, so what's your reaction when you hear some people suggesting um, that, you know, the government and those close to Brittany, that they want to keep this case under wraps for the most part? Is this petition helping or hurting? I think the petition absolutely is helping because it was after the petition was launched that – um, Hillary Clinton retweeted an article that discussed it, and we've seen a little bit of motion because of that. Um, I've spoken to some retired WNBA players, all who have played overseas during their careers, who basically said that the silence is about not wanting to cause harm, and we absolutely respect that, but multiple things can exist. Uh, people can express concern and issue calls to our elected officials to um, prioritize her case, to get her home, while also not wading into geopolitical matters that most of us are not really qualified to speak on um, at, any, at any depth. So that's why the petition is specifically geared towards pressuring elected officials to get her home rather than wading into other things. TJ, I want to bring you into the conversation because my colleague, Andrew Mitchell, had a State Department spokesman on, uh, Ned Price, who weighed in on this conflict, and then I want to get your thoughts on the other side. We're deeply concerned about this case, in part because uh, we have not yet been granted consular access. That is to say that uh, embassy officials at our embassy in Moscow have not yet been able to visit uh, Brittany Griner. Uh, Russia has an obligation under the Vienna Convention to allow consular access, to allow our officials uh, to see her. We are going to continue to press for that, to continue uh, to see to it that Russia lives up to its international obligations. All the while, we're going to do everything we can uh, to see to it that her rights uh, are respected. So, TJ, there's this uh, Russian-backed prison monitoring group who said they've been in touch um, with Griner and they've spoken with her with the help of a translator, um, uh, with the help of her cellmate who speaks Russian and English, who was serving as an interpreter. Um, what do you make of all of this, and what have you uncovered in your reporting? Should we believe that she's okay? Um, and, and what's the latest that you've uncovered? Well, I, I, I believe she's okay simply because that's what I've heard from her representatives who say they're getting that information from her Russian attorneys who get to see her several times a week. I wouldn't put a ton of stock in that report from TASS, a Russian state media reporting you know, a Russian organization uh, that we simply can't account for. People like Brittany Griner, when they're you know in custody in Russia, are used for propaganda purposes. So they are not happy at all about the lack of access. What to me was interesting about the statement from the State Department is the fact that they made one. I mean, they've been, you know, as Tamron said, very deliberate about trying to keep this below the radar. They feel now the best strategy is just try to keep this as, as something that is not a political matter. They can try to keep it in the criminal justice system. Uh, but the fact that they spoke at all means that uh, to signal that they're ready to be a little more vocal, that they may be moving toward a strategy where they do want some full court public press on this. 
Well, uh, we're doing that just now. And Tamron, you know, to your point that you brought up about um, why she was even over there in the first place, um, the WNBA commissioner came out uh, on March 5th, I believe, um, and talked about um, or kind of disputed this belief that she's over there playing and that WNBA players cannot make um, any money um, and that top players can earn somewhere between, I think, five hundred and six hundred and fifty thousand dollars just, just your take on that, that the commissioner is pushing back against some of this, but the players themselves are saying, yes, this is how we make money and this is how we survive. All right, pause, pause right there. All right, uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. Uh, we're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. Remember, right, uh, be sure to register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, and then also you can support us, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Remember, right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll count it forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by. Stand by. Just a second here. Okay, I'm going to finish up that clip. Sure, is pushing back against some of this, but the players themselves are saying, yes, this is how we make money and this is how we survive. Um, your thoughts there? Um, it's, it's a couple of things. Like, first of all, I do want to give Commissioner Engelberg credit because she, under the 2020 collective bargaining agreement, made just drastic changes that have improved the lives of these players. So that's number one. And some of the uh, things that she's rolled out just have not taken effect yet. So players are getting more and more money each year that the CBA is in, is in effect. Um, they're seeing more of those benefits. But at the same time, they're not there yet. And players are still playing abroad because they want the money. Um, I spoke with Arike Agumbawale last year, who plays in Russia for a different team. And I asked her, what are the upsides to playing abroad? She said, there is no upside, it's just for the money. Um, in 2019, there was an injury crisis with the WNBA in which a star or starter on every team was out for the season or missed most of the season with injury because they are not resting their bodies. They're playing year-round basketball. And the three uh, former players I spoke with on Thursday all said we were there because we needed to make a living. We love basketball, of course. The passion is there or they wouldn't be doing it. But the reason for shipping out has been to get exponentially higher, uh, higher wages than they can command here. And even though we're talking about the Brittany Griner case, I just want to add that, you know, I think people, fans have been questioning the silence. And in part, it could be because if we look too closely, we can see that this is not the first time a U.S. basketball player has been, you know, potentially in a catastrophic situation um, while playing abroad. Um, a, a team owner was killed in 2010, 2014. We had um, players kind of a narrow miss of a bombing of a subway station in Russia um, with Chechen rebels. So this has been, it's been a ticking time a bomb challenge, for a while. Yeah, for a long time. We're running out of time. TJ, I just want to ask you really quickly before we go, um, everything we know about the case itself is coming from Russia. Um, so has it even been confirmed that she was definitely trying to sneak these uh, vape cartridges? Um, could this have been some sort of uh, ulterior motives here? Have you uncovered anything like that in your reporting? That was to you, TJ. Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like we lost TJ. My producers are happy to hear that since they've been telling me we're out of time. So thank you so much, Tamron Spruill and TJ Quinn. We'll have to pick this conversation up another time. Okay, so that was from um, Tiffany Cross's show. Great uh, segment there from Tiffany Cross on uh, MSNBC. Hopefully I'll be on our show one day. Um, the name of that segment is that's from msnbc.com name of that segment russian court extends wnba star Brittany griner's arrest to may 19th okay so that's probably the most extensive segment now well black news channel had a more had a longer segment than this one but this one here probably had more information but black news channel has been doing more coverage but um uh, Reverend Al Sharpton dealt with this, I think, on Politics Nation, but 
The other shows on MSNBC, they've only dealt with Brittany Griner. When this news came out, they only dealt with her for like a minute or two. Okay. Tiffany Cross has been do doing more in-depth coverage. And also she's been covering um, other stories. Because like on MSNBC, they've been doing like Ukrainian uh, coverage of the Ukraine invasion 24-7. And there's a whole lot of other stories that largely get pushed to the side. I mean, because if you watch MSNBC, you think like that's the only story going on in the world right now. Whereas the Black News Channel, Roland Martin Unfiltered, Tiffany Cross, jo Joanne Reed to a certain extent, Joy's on during prime time. So she deals with a lot of Ukraine, but she deals also with other issues, especially issues pertaining to African Americans. Reverend Al Sharpton, they're, they're doing more coverage. And, and they're in they're calling attention because tiffany cross made the point today in uh saturday and also reverend l sharpton is like wait a second you have all these other issues out here that impact the african-american community that are largely being ignored focusing on ukraine and you know uh on the black news channel like dr mark lamont hill and it's been a few other people charles blow as well They've been talking about, well, in the past 16 months, you've had 16 coups in Africa. This largely gets ignored by, quote unquote, mainstream media. All right. So this is why African-American owned media and African-American targeted media responsible, not the sensationalism, uh, gossip nonsense. But this is why this is so important. OK, so look, we are. Um, this other topic we're going to get to uh, on uh, on Monday because I have an update dealing with there's another segment I wanted to share dealing with Mississippi and Governor Tate Reeves and the anti-critical race theory uh, bill. But uh, very quickly, we're celebrating our 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. Now, contrary to popular belief, even though I'm on 19 a.m. Superstation WFDF, they don't pay me to do radio. I don't get paid to do radio. So. We have to generate, be creative and generate revenue and teaching online classes and selling my DVD lectures and digital downloads and any support that we get from uh, uh, viewers and, and selling advertising and all that stuff. They don't they don't pay me to do radio. Um, you can support if you like this type of information, if you learned uh, from the African History Network show in the past 12 years, I'm sure you sure you've learned a thing or two. Uh, <laughs> you can support us dollar sign the AHN show through cash app dollar sign the AHN show through cash app also through PayPal paypal.me forward slash the AHN show paypal.me forward slash the AHN show so we're here six days a week this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills also I'm on Roller Martin Unfiltered every Friday I don't get paid to be on Roller Martin Unfiltered either um, you know, I help, you know, I'm happy to help Roland. And I used to guess host when I used to be on the Palmer Radio Network, I didn't get paid to do that stuff. I was on five days a week in the Palmer Radio Network. So um, but you know, we have to continue to work. So you can support us here, and also you can register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Um Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. And from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for only $100. Uh, if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. You'll get 50% off the bundle pack. We have a new class starting up on, uh, I pushed it back to Saturday, March 26th. It's a four hour online class, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. This is going to start up March 26th. March 26th and April 2nd. We know March is um, Women's History Month. This uh, online class is $25. We'll deal with uh, over 100 different African women all throughout history all different time periods from antiquity to African Queens to scientists 
uh, those in medicine, politicians, sports figures, uh, entertainment, okay, great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. And uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. That's uh, $25. And uh, we'll post a link here also for that. Okay. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. All right. And uh, you can email me uh, also, AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And if you want to advertise with the African History Network show, you want to advertise your uh, African American owned business, email us also. A current promotion, buy one month, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. Now, I, I, I posted uh, earlier in the week. Um, about the Power in One conference coming up uh, from uh, Taiki Grant and um, uh, a One Africa Power and Unity conference that's taking place in Detroit. Okay, so uh, we're going to post this information. Uh, I'll post the link here. We'll post this information on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. This is coming up. Um, this is coming up. Saturday, April 30th, and Sunday, May 1st, 2022, Double Tree Hotel. Okay. Double Tree Hotel. Um, okay, Janae Davis. Thanks for thanks for your uh donation. We appreciate the support, Janae. Uh Power and Unity Conference live. If, so you can attend in person, but there'll also be a live stream um uh, from Detroit as well. There'll be a live stream that you can watch from around the uh around the world actually and i'm going to post the information here uh let me see here on one conference and you know we've had taki grant and uh some of the people who were in the film hapi uh that was deals with the role of uh african culture the role of economics in, in african culture and I was supposed to be in the documentary, but we can never connect to uh, record my uh, segment of the documentary. But you have Dr. Leonard Jeffries in there and Professor James Small. Um, you have um, uh, Dr. Wade Nobles, I think, is in, is in the film. So I'm going to post the link here. You can register here through Eventbrite. You can register here through Eventbrite. So we posted that. We'll put the link on our website africanhistorynetwork.com also um so this is the power in unity conference two-day conference here in detroit michigan let me post this here okay and i just posted the link uh to uh eventbrite So come join us uh, in Detroit for the One Africa Power and Unity Conference on uh, Saturday, April 30th, 2022, and Sunday, uh, Sunday, May 1st, 2022. The conference will be live, and let me pull this up here. Dr. Maleficetti Asante will be there also, chair of the um, Afro-American Studies Department that, um, or the Africology uh, Afrikali uh department there at uh, temple university we've had him here on the show we're going to uh interview a lot of these people who are going to be at the conference i'll be there as well don't know if i'll be doing a presentation i have a vendor booth there i know that um okay let me see Can we... okay happy presents one africa power and unity uh conference So, uh, Professor Jane Small, Dr. Linda Jeffries, uh, uh, Dr. Jeffries' wife, Dr. Rosalyn Jeffries, Dr. Chike Akua out of Atlanta. You're going to have Dr. Maleficetti Asante, Jabari Osazi, uh, Infudushi, um, Jahutimans, who we've had on the show before. We've had Chike Akua on the show before. Also, Dr. Mawulana Karenga um, uh, uh, as well. So, you have an all star cast. Um, we posted the link here to uh, purchase tickets one africa power and unity conference in detroit michigan uh come join us live 
uh, the One Africa Power and Unity two day conference, April 30th, May 1st. Locations at the Double Tree Suites uh, by Hilton Hotel, uh, D downtown Detroit, Fort Shelby, 525 West Lafayette Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan. Um, Hapi, in association with Aket Tours, is hosting the inaugural One Africa Power and Unity two day conference in Detroit. You will hear enlightening uh, lectures from renowned scholars such as Dr. Mawalana, Dr. Mawalana Karinga, Professor Jane Small, Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Rosalyn Jeffries, Dr. Maleficate Asante, and Fudishi uh, Dr. Susan uh, Tata, uh, Asar Mhotep, Dr. Theophil Obinga, uh, Dr. Chike Akua, Jabari Osazi, Bayina Bello, and more. The One Africa conference theme illustrates that all African cultures and peoples are linked together either through ethnicity, language, arts, or culture. Either through ethnicity, language, arts, or culture. Presenters will unpack the historical connectivity and confluence of African people moved throughout the world. So we're talking about Pan-Africanism. The conference will also feature the essence of one Africa and how it relates to the power in unity, which is at the core of our principles in the Hapi movement. Now, you know, we hosted, we, the, uh, the Hapi tour ran in uh, 2021 and it started here in Detroit. So I, uh was the uh i um uh, was the host of it here in detroit uh and we had dr leonard jeffries here in detroit at the charles h wright museum of african-american history and we did a screening of the documentary hapi um and uh, we had a panel discussion also okay so i moderated the panel discussion the conference will also feature the essence of one africa and how it relates to the power and unity which is at the core of our principles in the Hapi movement. The very symbol of Hapi itself speaks to the power of unity. Conference attendees will experience stimulating and interactive lectures for multiple lessons of study. The conference will take place on Saturday, April 30th, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sunday, May 1st, 12 noon to 4 p.m. If you are coming to the event in Detroit, your ticket includes admission for both days and the official One Africa Power in Unity commemorative book. If you are live streaming the event, you will be sent the two link, you will be sent the link two days before the event and the morning of the event. Please make sure you check your spam folders before panicking. Please make sure you check your spam folder, folders before you contact them and say, hey, I didn't get the link. Check your spam folders. You can reach out to them at info at hapifilm at gmail.com with any questions, okay? And they have vendors set up also, $35 uh, ticket. The ticket includes a 35-day, the ticket includes a $35 table setup fee, six-foot tables and internet access, vendors only, okay. So uh, contact them about being a vendor. But we posted our link here. We have a special link so you can register for this conference and uh, I'll see you there uh, here in Detroit. I don't have far to go because I live right near the hotel. Uh, we'll see you there. You'll hear a lot more about this as well. We'll put this on our website, also AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, I posted about this on our fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Okay. So uh, be sure to follow us here on Facebook, turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on live notifications both places so you know when we go live. Give us a thumbs up here on this broadcast or a heart if you like it on Facebook and YouTube and on Twitter. Um, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. We have to get out of here. Remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. Uh, it's not over till we win. Wakanda forever.
and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. The Business Scaling Challenge is a seven-day online event that is taking place the week of March 13th through March 19th, 2022. This challenge will guide a group of business owners through scaling their businesses. Business owner Ronnie Sumler is hosting the Business Scaling Challenge in remembrance and honor of her father, the late civil rights activist Rodney Sumler. He helped a lot of African-American-owned businesses and local community leaders participate in politics. However, when he passed away, all of his ventures died with him. This inspired his daughter, Ronnie Sumler, to help community business owners preserve their businesses. Her business, Digital Dandelions, offers business Bibles to record business processes and procedures. Their business Bibles are their branded run of show business manuals that have everything you need to run your business in one place. Their business scaling kit is the first step in creating a business Bible. It includes everything needed to grow your business in one place. Join the Business Scaling Challenge Facebook group for more information and good luck in scaling your business. Come and travel with me to a time long ago and place far away. You will experience high adventure and excitement. You are fighting alongside an ancient army in fierce battle. Feel the exhilaration of struggle and final conquest. My name is Maninkare and I am both a prince and a priest in one of the most advanced civilizations humans have ever produced. I want you to ride with me in my chariot as I slay the barbarians who have come to invade my land. I invite you to sit at the conference table with the great Pharaoh Taharqa and his ministers as they plan intrigue and use subterfuge to outmaneuver and defeat the enemy. Come back with me to the land of your ancestors, to the beautiful land of Kemet. So open the pages of this book and begin the adventure. Find out what happens in the book, Maninkare Battles the Assyrians in the Nile Valley from author Makari Jones. Get your copy today at Amazon.com.